Why do we talk about technology when it comes to design thinking? I think all the projects that I have done on design thinking with corporate individuals, and by the way, they will also act as mentors on the virtual center of excellence very soon. So we're building a team of mentors also. When I, when I was doing projects with uh, the corporate organizations, we realized that all prototypes, all without exception, started integrating technology in it because technology allows scalability. Technology also allows a tremendous flexibility. Technology also allows best practices of the industry to be brought in. Now, why is it that technology comes into prototyping? Why is it that technology comes into design thinking? Now, let's look at the way design thinking operates. Now, we are also setting up design thinking centers for corporate organizations in India. And while these design thinking centers uh, do get set up, uh, we must appreciate that design thinking as a project happens globally. Now, you know, we need to open up our dimensions to design thinking today because, you know, we are, we are now moving into a very advanced stage of uh, discussions on uh, design thinking. Let's understand this, which is the context today that I want to talk about. Design thinking projects that your students will do, design thinking that your students will learn when they get into corporate organizations or when you start interfacing with industry big time as academicians, we are all a part of a global system of design thinkers. That means organizations have global circuit of design thinkers. They also have global design thinking centers. Everybody from remote areas, from various places, log in. I also want to introduce you to a concept called the digital nomads. Now, I'm a digital nomad. Who are digital nomads? These are a bunch of highly specialized people in a particular domain who choose to give up their jobs and work under multi-contract arrangements with organizations. And they could be located anywhere. Possibly they could be located in the remotest corner of the country and they have access to internet. They have access to technology. And through that, they are able to service any client. So the way I envisage design thinking to start operating as it matures, we will have a lot of specialists who are technology folks, specialists in their domain. For instance, if an automotive project or a biotechnology project is happening over the uh, entire design thinking global circuit, you will have specialists coming in, logging in for stipulated time, participating in the design thinking process, exit and move into another design thinking process and participate there. So that's the way design thinking will operate. That's the way organizations will operate and digital nomads are a reality now post pandemic. Highly paid, extremely specialized, controlled under intellectual properties, controlled under non-disclosure agreements, very clear contractual arrangements with organizations. And these people keep researching, keep reading, keep updating their knowledge, and possibly they could be academicians too. And they provide services to organizations. Now you can start looking at that prospect for your colleges also, where colleges which are running design thinking can actually start catering to different industries uh, with the host of faculties, specialized faculties that they have, and you can actually start providing services over internet. What I'm going to talk about is ICT or information and communication technology. If you study the pillars of the World Economic Forum, where they have a report that they publish every year, which is called the ease of doing business, where they rank countries in terms of how easy it is to do business in those countries. They have a very specific pointer there on ICT or information and communication technologies. There is a trust worldwide to increase penetration of internet and communication technologies. In fact, I understand that a lot of work is not only happening in India, but in Africa too. Now, a lot of you will have this uh, thought in your mind, are we advanced enough in India to actually discuss what we are discussing today? I need to give you a perspective to that. Let's appreciate that India is quite a capital on technology worldwide. 
We are fantastic in terms of our internet and our prowess of technology. In fact, the number of talented people in this country are vast. I do a lot of international sessions and I can tell you with assurance that our broadbands, our fibers, our internet, they are very, very stable and we are capable of running very advanced technologies through the internet. So please don't look at this session today that I'm going to take you through as only an academic interest, but I'm talking about what is going to be the future of technology in this country and how design thinking interweaves along with that. Some of you had questions on intellectual property. We're going to talk about IP also while we move through the space of the ICT today, because it is going to be increasingly difficult to protect intellectual property in the new world that we enter of blockchains. We have a specialist here in the group who is doing a lot of work on blockchain, and I'm sure he would also be able to add in a lot of value as we move through blockchains. But I'm not going to get into the pro programming part of it. I'm not getting into the technology part of it. I'm focusing more on the application part of it. I'm focusing more in terms of how a non software engineer would look at integrating technology in design thinking. One disclaimer before we start, I'm talking to faculties, which is you. I leave it to your wisdom completely as to what you would want to offer to your students. My job here is to give you everything that I know about technology, my research on technology to all of you, and the content will be available for all of you. You decide through your own wisdom how you want to tailor it for your first year engineering students. Because I'm sure somebody will say on the chat, this will be too heavy for the students. And I agree it will be heavy for the students, but not for you. But my job is I'm dealing with faculties right now. And my job is to give you everything that I know. So therefore, this entire conversation today is structured around the entire research as to what the future of technology looks like. Therefore, being a student of international business, I can say this with confidence that though the World Trade Organization talks about TRIPS, which is controlling the trade related IPs of various uh, organizations and various enterprises worldwide, but the world that we are living in, the borderless world that we are living in today, nothing is not copyable. Everything is copyable and therefore it's going to become increasingly difficult to protect any innovation because even if we patent it, somebody could tweak it and somebody could create a variance in terms of a feature variant that would come out and that could become another patent. So let's be cautioned. Let's be forewarned that we're talking about the entire citizenship that's opening up on the internet and it's going to be extremely difficult to control the content. In fact, we at Atyasa believe in democratization of knowledge, and that's why we are offering everything free in terms of the content for people. We are only charging for our specialized experience that cannot be copied. So what am I trying to say here? All of us here need to build a core competence within us, which cannot be copied. And I think human beings cannot be copied. The knowledge and the applied experience that human beings have cannot be replicated at all, but products and services can be replicated, but the culture cannot be replicated. The softer dimension cannot be replicated. Possibly the type of processes that you build cannot be replicated. Possibly what goes behind the product to create a product cannot be replicated. So let's keep that in the back of our mind and then let's enter into this conversation here. Why does these next four hours become very critical? Sir, did I, I did not get a feedback for the phone. Okay, so the further feedback, uh, please take it up directly uh, with the uh, folks who are organizing it. I can't really help you. Let me come back to the technology bit and why are we talking about it? So like I said, uh, we will be operating in a global circuit of innovators and the global circuit of innovators will be logging in in a virtual space somewhere in the cloud and design thinking projects will be happening. Now, have we done that? Yes, we've done that. 
we ran a 24 by 7 21 day war room which was completely online using technology now obviously in my office i've created a technology backbone by which we can actually run uh, such war rooms on design thinking and i think you all can also start looking at creating such kind of design centers which are technology based design centers back in your institutions also let me get cracking now straight on to the the presentation there you go all right so let me talk about the presentation with you now uh, is the presentation visible somebody could unmute and tell me that please so visible sir thank you so much so we are discussing our future with technology i am probably some people will say that i'm talking sky fi i'm not talking sky fi i'm talking researched reality so look at this entire session in terms of research reality half of it i'll cover till 11 30 the other half we, i will i will cover post we coming back at 11 40 as we did yesterday so we're talking about future of technology a lot of consulting organizations worldwide are doing a lot of research as to where technology is going so therefore i think it's important to look at what is it that we're discussing today i'm going to talk about the state of technology i'm going to talk about the evolution of the industry i'm talking about technology trends audio not clear please uh, connect your uh, system uh, away from either the magnetic influences of the wi-fi or you can be on a broadband uh, my connection is absolutely stable here yeah i'm checking that no problem at all okay it's clear thank you all right so we're also going to be talking about business applications that's the way we're going now let's understand what has pandemic done like every pandemic which i was talking about yesterday or any calamity that sets in what happens is a complete technology disruption starts happening now where are we entering now we are entering what we call is industry 4.0 and we are at the cusp of 5.0 and i'm going to discuss 5.0 also as we move ahead just hold on all right there was a distraction here which i dealt with all right we are also talking about web 3.0 now what is web 3.0 these are intelligent highly intelligent web solutions web architectures which are going to be doing a lot of data crunching and therefore the human requirement will move away the metaverse we are entering the space of metaverse now if you see the picture on the right hand side that has been captured as what metaverse would look like this is complete 3d immersive technology that we are getting into now how does this help in design thinking i think this question is bound to come immediately why are we discussing all this like i said design thinking will create prototypes which will have inherent technologies built into them why am i saying that i'm saying that because today technology and domain is becoming absolutely gray now when i say technology and domain is becoming gray we are all educationists here we are all academicians here let's understand how even academics has become gray academics has brought in so much technology that who thought that post pandemic we will have portals available which will start creating very advanced learning processes who knew that artificial intelligence tracking systems of students everything will start happening and analytics will be thrown out by the system so that the human crunching also gets taken care of all that becomes so important well sir if the audio is people i can't really help you i think probably we'll have to be uh, testing the audio at your side like i said i have a high speed fiber here yeah so it is clear for some people it's not clear let's live with it uh, possibly there's a my suggestion to a lot of you here please do not use wi-fi because if you're using wi-fi you will have call drops happening for sure all right let me come back to what i was discussing 
industry 4.0 industry 5.0 why are we talking about in it in design thinking because every prototype that we're going to build every prototype will have a base because like i said we are living in a space where technology is completely gray and the domains are interfacing with each other. Now, when we say academics, that's where I was before the ping came in and I lost a little bit of track. Sorry for that. So let's look at us as academicians. We've got portals where e-learning is happening. The government has created portals where e-learning is happening. Uh, blended learning is happening. Uh, analytics is coming into place. Very soon, and again, I'm not talking SkyFi, but I'm actually working on it in my organization. You could actually create in the immersive technology of Metaverse, a hologram of yourself. And that hologram would have all the content that you have and the hologram will start delivering perpetual classrooms, 24 by seven, 365 days across the borders of the world. Now that's the kind of world that we are entering into with the technology. Is that going to happen? Yes. And uh, where did all this information come from? Well, I'm very passionate about technology because I come from a technology domain. I started my career, though I'm a mechanical engineer, but I decided to start my career in information technology way back in 87. In 1987, it was an 8088 CPU. From there on, I have seen a whole lot of transition happening in technology. And today, Atyasa also is a highly tech-oriented company. In fact, we pride ourselves as the only tech-oriented consulting house today, which is dealing with human behavior and design thinking. Let's keep that at the back of our mind, that there is a person talking to you who believes in complete technology and technology needs to be viewed in. So any student asking you this question, why are we building technology into the curriculum? Please tell them, no design thinking in future will happen without technology. That's metaverse, 3D. You're entering into immersive space. We're going to be talking about how this whole thing gets revolutionized when it comes to prototyping. Here we go. Let's talk about how the industry evolved over a period of time. So if you see the 18th century, we all as engineers know that you know, 18th century saw the first industrial revolution where things started, machines getting powered by steam and a lot of mechanization came into play. And people, I'm sure at that point in time in the 18th century were absolutely wow about what was happening because to a large extent, it revolutionized a lot of things because mechanization was not known. Mostly people were dealing with skilled labor. In the 19th century, that's when a lot of stuff started changing. In the 19th century, Electricity and assembly lines came in. Henry Ford actually brought in the assembly line. We all know about it. And standardization, mass production, all that started happening, which all which kind of brought down the pricing for sure for everything that was happening. But the later part of 1970s, when the third industrial revolution happened, that's when automation started happening. But we were using memory chips. And I remember there were mainframes, there were those massive hard disks. There were those tapes, which just don't happen anymore. And I remember these uh, PCs, PCXTs based on 80286, 8088. They were so expensive in their own way, uh, mostly used for word processing. That is what the 1970s was. And at that point in time, I realized in India, by the time it was 1987, 1988, a massive information technology uh, boost started happening in our country. A lot of technology orientation came in our country. Government started uh, computerizing themselves. And I'm glad I was a part of this whole process because I saw the transition. I think a lot of us here who belong to my generation, uh, you know, we've seen a time when there was no television to a time when black and white television came when the color television came, then computers came, and today we are witnessing massive technology. I think we've seen the entire transition. And whenever I talk about this slide, I go back into my childhood during the days when, you know, uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Rima. Yes, the golden days for sure. Um, I guess how you look at it today, I don't know, but I would look at today's day as platinum for sure, because I think the speed at which we are doing business now is amazing. But what happened after that? When the industry 4.0 came in, 
information and communication technologies came in big time. In fact, I know when I was, uh, I think I was a regional manager then for an information technology company. And at that point in time, there were no emails. Uh, letters and correspondences used to go by courier. We had telex machines, we had fax machines. But then came internet. Intranet came first and then internet came and internet started changing the entire dynamics of the way businesses were operating, emails were operating. I would encourage all of you to read a beautiful book. I'm highly inspired by that book written by Kinichi Omayo. He's a Japanese consultant to a lot of governments. He wrote a book called The Borderless World. And 40 years ago, he predicted how the world would be based on technology and based on internet when it would be completely borderless and economies would be completely borderless. And it's very interesting today also that book is absolutely relevant. Please do catch up this book. Kinichi Omayo is the author, Borderless World. Normally the book is out of print, but if you can lay your hands on it, nothing like it, it'll revolutionize the way uh, you would do design thinking for sure. Now, what happened when the fourth industrial revolution came in? Information, content became the king. Now let's understand, all of us here are faculties. We are rich and loaded with content. I think faculties, the whenever we teach, you know, I, I read up a very interesting research uh, which said that the more you interact with people and the more you exchange information, information and converse with people, the more knowledge and content you build. All of you here without exception on this call today are loaded with content. Now in this century, the 21st century that we are in, knowledge is supreme, content is king. We are entering the times again of the times of Takshashila where knowledge and teachers were supposed to be extremely profound. And I'm glad that particular era has started all over again. Now, what if all of you here after this session were to imagine that we can all become immortal with all the content that we have. And if we are able to digitize this entire content, you can imagine what would happen. Now, how do we digitize this when we're talking about information and communication technologies? Let me talk about some basics before I move on to the next slide. Because it's, it's important to cover the basics and most of us, all of us know. Now let's understand this. There are, the first instance is there are micro websites. Now what are micro websites? These are websites like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Now how do they allow you as a faculty to go borderless? Very interesting. For instance, now I'm not promoting any social media here, please. Don't take me wrong. I'm not paid by them at all. My job is to really ensure as to how faculties can go borderless in terms of their content and how design thinking can be done. On LinkedIn, you can blog, you can have your showcases where you can write down articles, you can do newsletters. Your students have an archival of your content available on this microsite and they can read up. And students who want to tap into your intellect as a faculty, but they're not your students directly. These folks can also tap into your content and your knowledge. And you don't know how many people are really consuming your content. Podcasts, and I've been into podcasts big time. I mean, uh, thank you the other day when my introduction was happening, but why did I move into podcasts? What are podcasts? Podcasts are simple audio files. Now, how do they help? Let's say you were to record one of your sessions. And when you record that session, you have two choices. Either you can have a choice of a video or an audio. Let me give you advantages of audio now. And we're still on the fourth industrial revolution. We're not getting into the future right now. An audio file uploaded on a podcasting portal. Your student can listen to the lecture. Revise before the exam. While the student is traveling, 
while the student is possibly doing something else, he's got headphones in, he's got earplugs in, and is listening to your voice. Voice is extremely powerful. In fact, when students are there in our classroom, they are mostly listening to us. But because five senses and gratification of five senses is important, they're also seeing us. Today, using technology, whether you are using any platform uh, to deliver your lectures, they're not only seeing you, but they're listening to you more. In fact, they're listening to you more and therefore, Podcasts and audios are big time. Now, when I release my center of excellence for you during the break, you will have podcasts on design thinking available to you. You can listen to them. Your students can listen to them. Videos is the next big thing and interactive videos is the next big thing. Now, what's the advantage of a video? Let's say you were to record your sessions and you were to host them i mean youtube is one of the areas where you can host i use vimeo because i like to protect my intellectual property i don't want to open it up to public i want to restrict it also it is becoming interactive now what is the advantage of a video you know a lot of us as faculties we're specialists in the way we operate a lot of times students cannot rewind us when we are taking our sessions they may miss certain pearls of wisdom that are being offered while we are doing a lecture. The best thing about a video is they can rewind and they can listen to you again. This is absolutely mind boggling, though it seems to be very simple. But I tell you, most of the places where I've taken a feedback on my e-learning portal as to what is it that people liked, what they said is, if we don't understand the concept, we can rewind, we can go back, and we can only see that portion. And that makes a video extremely powerful. Make as many videos as possible. Because what happens is, while you have taught the student, the student has access to the videos in the background, and you have analytics available, which also tell you which student logged in what time, what did the student do with the video, and post the video, you can also have quizzes. That's also another way. <clears throat> blogs one of the best ways of going about is writing publications digital publications blogs the consumption is worldwide people consume your content like crazy they get in touch with you and they say can you please come over in fact industry a lot of institutions today are facing a challenge of industry finding value with from academic institutions now, if you have videos, if you have audios, if you have blogs, the industry folks, the CEOs can access your intellectual property. They can learn from it. And who knows, they might just want you or your institution to go there and consult them. Because what happens is content is so powerful that it convinces people completely before even they want to interact with you. So I talked about podcasts. I talked about videos. I talked about blogs. You can also now prepare ebooks. Jiffy, in a Jiffy, ebook making is no longer a complicated process. You have a whole lot of softwares available in the cloud which can take your content. In fact, a lot of these systems that I'm now uh, kind of uh, uh, researching, they pick up content from your website directly and they're intelligent enough to convert that into a book. These are three dimensional books and, uh, you know, that's kind of the area, which is immersive technologies that we're getting into. So these are three dimensional books, which you can flip like a paper. They make the sound of a paper. They give you complete experience of what the flip book is all about. Don't worry. All that I'm talking about is available as an experience on the center of excellence. You can go there and take a complete experience as to how the 3D immersive technologies operate in the digital world. You can have. Digi books that you can write on design thinking, you can write digi books in the areas that you are teaching. In fact, I find a lot of faculties who have created their own digital books, uploaded them on their websites. You can have your own website. It's no longer expensive to have our own websites. You can have your own website where you have your loaded content in terms of your specialization. Your students can log in there and have complete access. 
and you know your students are going to be extremely happy when you start opening up this kind of content will it be misused i don't know will it be copied possibly but like i said we are living in a world how does it matter because the best part about digital technology is you can constantly update your content and therefore it becomes non imitable in any case so these are the basics of the content management that is available but it's time to now move into advanced stuff and what is the advanced stuff looking like so we are currently in the fourth industrial revolution where internet is big time we are talking about having consolidated ourselves in 4g 4g we are now getting into 5g and 5g is going to revolutionize the entire world and i think education will get completely revolutionized with 5g coming in and i think it's time to prepare and that's what i'm going to be talking about as we move ahead communication technologies i think the way people are communicating with each other is getting a lot more simplified it's becoming a lot more powerful and i think if teachers if faculties can tap into communication technologies i think they will be not only be able to reach borderless but they will also be able to make effective use of the number of students that they can actually deal with at any given point in time all those who are teaching lean would agree that travel time is dead time now if travel time is dead time the information and communication technologies are actually making dead time into productive time podcasts are making dead time into productive time videos are making dead time into productive time blogs are making dead time into productive time these technologies that we are working on right now maybe i would have had to travel to bangalore to do this session and that would have entailed a complete business day of mine that's got crunched thankfully because i do a half day session and i get on to half day work that's the way it works right what's the future looking like the picture on the left hand side depicts what the future is going to look like we are moving into artificial intelligence i'm certified on artificial intelligence and therefore i think i'm quite okay dealing with the subject also where is artificial intelligence taking us well all the data that is there across all the servers in the cloud systems on the planet all the data will now be integrating itself and it will become extremely intelligent to do a lot of planning and decision making and execution controls for businesses artificial intelligence will not replace a human being because human being out of the real time experience will feed the content of that experience into artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence therefore will gain knowledge constantly and the number of people who will be feeding information to artificial intelligence will be humongous in fact like I, like i was saying every time we are using our mobile phone it is feeding so much information and even if we are not using a mobile phone even if you're using smart smart speakers it's feeding a lot of information while i was going through my ai certification i hit upon a very interesting case study and i would like to discuss that because i said that design thinking storytelling works a lot there was an experiment done on intelligent toasters you know the bread toaster so the company came up with intelligent toasters and installed them in various homes for people it was a toaster which was intelligent obviously it came with the desired user interface but there was a lot of stuff happening in the background the intelligent toaster through the internet of things was feeding information to a repository an intelligent system back there somewhere in the cloud where all the integrated toasters were providing information on which household is using how much time for the toaster which household is using what type of bread how much time are they using for toasting each bread how many breads do they consume at what time during the day they consume the bread now imagine with this kind of i mean i am giving you very limited information probably the toaster would also be picking up signals and information about what's happening around who knows with that kind of information that a simple toaster is crunching and millions of toaster feeding it into a cloud system 
into an artificial intelligence system. That data can get available not only to manufacturers who are creating toasters, but that data can get available for possibly any food oriented industry or a non food oriented industry. This is the power of artificial intelligence. We are now moving into a world which will be dominated completely by artificial intelligence and big data. Web 3.0 is the next big thing. It's already there. Web 3.0 are the extension of the World Wide Web, the WWW, whichever domain name you would carry. These intelligent web, web systems will start crunching integrated data across different websites. So let's say there's a design thinking website that has been created by you. This design thinking website will start crunching data with all the other websites which have anything to do with design thinking. Or even if there is one particular blog or an audio on design thinking, it will start crunching that data and your website will become extremely intelligent and will start feeding information and decision making. Who knows, probably it will also be able to help you in terms of your prototyping. And right now I'm saying who knows, but when we discuss the advanced technologies, you realize that is definitely on the cards. In fact, prototyping will not be crowdsourcing only. Prototyping will also be all the data that's available across the blockchain coming together and you will have intelligent systems which will start giving you options of prototyping. Web 3.0 are intelligent websites which will integrate with other websites and start taking intelligent decisions whenever a user logs into the website. Quantum computing revolutionizing the entire computing power completely. The power with which we are now going to start doing computing processes is going to be humongous. We will talk about quantum computing as we move through. 5G is not only about the speed of data. It's not only about the bandwidth that's being available, but it is also about supporting a whole lot of 5G applications in the background. In fact, 3D printing, which is the next big thing now. And while I was uh, getting myself certified around the areas of analytics and 3D printing, you will possibly be already knowing that human organs are now being 3D printed. Now you can imagine a prototype in design thinking that has been created can be 3D printed with ease and that 3D prototype is going to replace your clay models. That 3D prototype could be so integrate enough that it could actually not only manufacture certain small end items, but it could also start, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing a lot of complicated products for sure. And as 3D printing advances, I anticipate the entire manufacturing system and the entire electronic system will merge together and it will revolutionize the ancillary business. SMEs may not have lathe machines anymore or CNC's anymore. They may just move into 3D's and they may replace the requirements of molds. They may replace the requirement of tools, jigs, fixtures, everything, because you're going to be printing a wheel. You may also be printing a watch. That is the way uh, the entire 3D printing is going to operate. And 5G is going to be the basis for that. Metaverse. Facebook is already calling itself Meta. What is Metaverse? We will not be talking like this very soon. We will actually be entering a 3D room where the interactions are going to be live. There are already audio rooms. I mean, I do a lot of sessions on Clubhouse. And Clubhouse is an audio room where I don't even know the people who enter into my audio room from all over the world. And we have some fascinating conversations. And those conversations are then live conversations, which are recorded conversations, can be heard by anybody later on. Now, it's not only about conversations, it is about holograms, which will now start interacting with each other in a 3D space. Now, how does it revolutionize design thinking? Imagine a space which is operating borderless, where people in different time zones will enter a room, get to know what were the earlier discussions that happened. There will be transcripts available. There will be recordings available. And then they can feed in their own information and exit the room. This is going to be the power of the metaverse. Metaverse is a complete 3D immersive technology that we are moving into. This is the way the revolution is happening in the world today. 
and design thinking will not only play a critical role in the evolution of technology, but it will also play a role in the consumption of technology. I hope you found the first slide interesting because I like the first slide extensively because it's actually predicting the future. Gartner came up with a report as to what the future looks like. I read that report and I started researching the areas that they were talking about. And that's what I'm covering here completely in terms of what the technology looks like in future. But I've gone beyond that. I've added a lot more stuff in terms of what I found relevant in design thinking. So that's also been added. What is the message that we are giving our students in this slide? Don't look at the world through a myopic vision of the way it looks like today. Future is about quick innovations. Future is about integrating a whole lot of things that have already happened. Future is about picking up things which have been done by other people and integrating it to create prototypes. <coughs> Future is not going to be about reinventing the wheel. In fact, the process of benchmarking is going to be outdated very soon because with the kind of digital data that's available, the entire stuff you don't, I mean, when I work with automotive companies, it's a normal fact that every time a new vehicle is brought into the market, uh, the competitor buys the vehicle, rips it open, sees what it is, do reverse engineering, do benchmarking of every element, every component. That's no longer required because all that information will be available across the blockchains. Absolutely, uh, madam, uh, multidisciplinary is the way we are now going. In fact, most of the PhDs, uh, people who are researching, are becoming interdisciplinary researchers, multidisciplinary researchers. Uh, the specialization will have integration of a whole lot of other domains also coming into play. That's the world that we're living into. That is what is the message we will give our students. And remember, as we say, we're preparing our students for the future. And the future is, in a nutshell, extremely intelligent, extremely smart operating at very high levels of IQ, but it will not replace human beings. But certainly it will replace lazy human beings. That I envisage very clearly. So we also need to tell our students, they've got to really get cracking in the new world. So design thinking in the future and in the current space, how does it look like? Information and communications technology will enable unparalleled scalability. It is going to be like, you know, any design thinking project will operate worldwide. Now let's also understand how the education industry is evolving in India. A lot of foreign universities are here now. A lot many will enter. Therefore, technology will be absolutely critical. Because a technology revolution, like I'm saying, is happening and it is entering the edutech business for sure. It's entering the edutech world for sure. Colleges are also understanding and realizing that infrastructure capacities can be more optimally utilized by using technology. With that happening and with foreign institutions happening, we are now set up for an amazing scalability in terms of the augmented reality and the advancements in technology that are happening. Therefore, I am extremely happy that VTU decided to put technology as a part of curriculum in the design thinking process. My humble submission to all of you, don't look at design thinking in terms of the credits. Look at design thinking as a process of innovation that your students are going through. And it's a very advanced process of innovation, extremely sophisticated, and the best part is it also integrates technology into it. Let's deep dive now into the top technology trends. I'm gonna talk about certain technology trends here, and then we will possibly uh, start taking questions uh, by the time we are touching uh, the next 20, 25 minutes. Let's look at the top technology trends. Data fabric. That's the first technology trend. Now, what is data fabric? Data fabric is going to help us to organize and solve complex data problems. Now, like I said, design thinking is all about solving complex problems, right? We talked about it yesterday. 
Now, what is Data Fabric doing? There is humongous data. And by the way, uh, I mean, I was, it was very interesting. When I was studying artificial intelligence, I realized that in certain domains, the knowledge and the content is doubling every three days. If every three days knowledge and content is developing in certain domains, can you imagine the amount of data, zillions of bytes that are currently there on the planet? And now in order to, to make utilization of the zillions of the bytes that are available, what are we doing in Data Fabric? Let's read it first. Data Fabric is designed to help organizations solve complex data problems and use cases by managing their data regardless of various kind of applications. So the first part is telling us that on my mobile phone, I may have 20 applications. There are thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who are using mobile phones and they have their own applications. Each application is crunching data. Each application that is crunching data is feeding data across the entire World Wide Web, across the internet. This humongous data, irrespective of the applications. Now, when we were talking about the initial technologies, the initial technologies controlled the data, such as the other platforms were not able to use that data because of the encryption that was there or possibly the way the coding happened. But today, when we're talking about data fabric, what are we saying? We're saying that applications are going to be open and these applications will feed every data every millisecond, every person, whether he's awake or he's sleeping, up there into the cloud. And this data fabric will therefore, by using all this data, converting it into intelligence, allow us as design thinkers to tap into this data, get smart deliverables from this data, and feed it into our prototypes. This is a revolution completely. And I think your student need not know how an app is designed and how the data would get transmitted. All that the student would know is, well, there is data fabric available. In the data fabric, I've got data available which can help me to solve complex problems. And the data is independent of the apps. Who knows? Maybe there's a hotel app which may provide certain inputs for a particular prototype that I'm building. So it is regardless of applications platforms and locations. Like I said, we're entering in, we've entered into a borderless world. So locations don't matter anymore. The data is going to be stored across countries, though countries are trying to restrict the use of data, but that's not going to be easy uh, in the times to come because the democratization of data is absolutely there. I mean, it cannot be controlled. In addition, data fabric enables frictionless access and data sharing in a distributed data environment. No longer we have a centralized data environment. There is no central server available which says that I'm controlling the whole data. The data is spread across all the servers through the entire cloud system. And now there's zillions of bytes that are available. Pharma companies can tap into it. Engineering companies can tap into it. Uh, technology companies can tap into it, maybe hospitality organizations can tap into it. And therefore, because in design thinking, we talk about diversity of experience, we're now moving into the next stage. Whether participants in the process have that kind of diversity of experience or no, with the data fabric and the kind of data that's available, we can actually crunch complete diverse information to create prototyping. Amazing stuff. Now, if we were to look at education, which delivers a whole lot of content and a whole lot of data, you can imagine if the data across all the universities in the world, all the colleges in the world, if that content is happening, then check the kind of data that's available. I'll take the questions. I'm so happy that the questions are coming in. I'll take the questions shortly as we move through. Let me cover up a few technologies and then I'll take up the questions, uh, certainly. Composable applications. Now in design thinking, this fits beautifully. Now how does composable applications fit in? Let's understand the concept of the composable applications. You know, every app is built with 
certain small small segments into it <coughs> so an app typically is an integration of a whole lot of segments composable applications are the idea where functional blocks of an application can be decoupled which means what are we doing let's say i'm doing a design thinking prototype and i believe in that design thinking prototype because design thinking also deals with rapid prototyping something that we learned yesterday if i'm doing a design thinking prototype and i realize that there is a particular app that was created and in that app there is a particular module a particular subset that is extremely important for my prototype i don't need to recreate it anymore i can just piece it out of that particular app and build it into my existing app is that happening it is happening already in fact i am an extensive user of a website called wordpress on wordpress my entire content moves and i have multiple websites on wordpress so i have a wordpress podcast i have my own wordpress site niketkarasgi.com and then of course there is the atessa.net on the wordpress there are a lot of free and paid plugins now let's say i want to build a feature of maybe talking to whatsapp number of mine from my website and that experience is available to you on my website i just download a plugin that plugin immediately integrates with my website and there is a whatsapp icon that appears on the page and people can start chatting up with me they have information available from me uh, on the fly now to build this kind of an app it would have taken me ages i may have had to maybe invite some consultants to work with me to do that to integrate it with my site but because of composable applications what's happening is your ability to prototype your concept becomes infinite and the best part about composable applications is that you can scale up your prototypes step by step in phases you have tested plugins and modules already available in different applications you can go check them out as to how do they work and if they suit your purpose you can just pick up that element and plug it into your prototype and it's going to work and like i said whether we are mechanical engineers uh, whether we are people who are into technology everything is interweaving and i think mechatronics is one area which is kind of explicitly dealing with situations that i'm talking about we have actually combined electronics and mechanical engineering today and the robotics and all the artificial intelligence this that we are building in is is so immense in fact the demand for mechatronics is going up in the market and one of the reasons is going up in the market is because if design thinking and metachronics can actually combine together it can be an amazing exercise so composable applications are functional blocks of applications that can be decoupled these individual parts can then be more finely tuned to create a new application that is ideological that means in design thinking you created a concept and now you have built in all the plugins together and you created your prototype more significant than the some of the parts that means what you're doing is that this whole integration of tested plugins coming together are creating an experience which is much more beyond than what would have happened if you were to build these features physically into a prototype now how does composable application work let me go back to automotive the car that we drive today is loaded with applications in fact very interesting i mean when i bought my sports car i was told that the key of my sports car actually has the entire data of the health of my vehicle and when i take my car for servicing all they do is place the key on a scanner and they have everything available to them possibly now cars through internet are also talking to the manufacturer and they're getting a lot of information through the apps that are there within but cars today are also carrying entertainment systems cars today are smart they have multiple applications now imagine with composable applications where multiple apps are developed you can actually cut and paste plug and play you can imagine what kind of prototypes we will be creating that's the story as far as the composable applications are concerned let's talk about distributed enterprises and design thinking again cloud technology 
will allow fewer people to manage more extensive networks worldwide, which means when you're running your design thinking projects, which are global design thinking projects, you may not have to invest in capital expenditures. Now in the borderless world, what happens? I mean, typically uh, when I teach international finance, in that we talk about stock exchanges. Now stock exchanges and transfer of money through the uh, banks, the international banks are happening 24 by seven today. Because as the sun rises and the sun sets and the sun rises somewhere else, you know, in those time zones, the stock markets are operating. In those time zones, banks are operating. So financial transactions are happening across. But do you need to keep your capital equipment idle when people in a particular location are sleeping? Not anymore. Now, let's say if you're doing a design thinking project, which is a global project. And by the way, technologies typically operate on global projects. And when we are looking at design thinking, design thinking, Take my word, every project in design thinking becomes so successful that ultimately organizations want to scale it up globally and therefore these technologies become extremely relevant. Now you can imagine if a design thinking project is happening in India and US is asleep, what's the point in having a capital equipment in the US uh, while people are sleeping there? Can I from here either operate that or can I have the power of the engine available in the cloud by which it can be distributed? And that is what is a distributed enterprise. The ability to use capital equipment, the ability to use subscription technologies, 24 by seven, all across the network of the organization. And with the set of people that you have, you're now limiting or maybe reducing your capital expenditure and the areas are becoming a lot more productive. Imagine you're working on a prototype through distributed enterprise. People are using different capital equipment. They're building the prototype together. And then you have a 3D printer somewhere. You use that 3D printer and you print. Or maybe you have 3D printers available across different uh, locations. And you can actually print the prototype across different locations. This is the next technology. And design thinking is going to use distributed enterprise extensively. Because let's understand, though design thinking in the practical world is fast, but it is blocking the talent of the organization. And that has a huge opportunity cost. With distributed enterprise, what we're doing is people can come in and exit while the design thinking is happening. And we are able to optimize the entire project of design thinking purely because of distributed enterprise. So in the first slide, I talked about the three areas. Data fabric, where humongous zillions of data are available all across. And now we're going to have an access where it is all going to operate in an intelligent way. Composable applications. In my prototype, I can plug and play all the best things that are available in the world. And if that particular thing is no longer good, and if something else comes available, all I need to do is deplug that and bring in a new stuff and my application is absolutely real-time and state-of-the-art. This distributed enterprise, I just talked about it. And therefore, these three technologies will definitely aid design thinking. I repeat, what you want to tell your students, I leave it to your wisdom. You will have this content available with you. Feel free how you want to talk about it to your students. I'm not saying you have to talk everything that is being discussed here right now. Take your call. What is it that you would like to talk about? Yesterday, there were some people who were very particular about IP. Here is the solution for them. Now, a lot of design thinking projects are very, very sensitive projects. I think while your students are in the college also, they may handle certain projects which are very sensitive. Let's say it's a government funded project and you're prototyping some special stuff there. And you don't want to leak it out to the world. The understanding in the world of internet, in the world of information communication technology is, can we now create a cyber mesh? That means we don't have a firewall alone on the system on which we are working, but we actually have a security mesh. Now imagine if a design thinker knows that through the security mesh, the entire project of design thinking. So let's say there's a design thinking center which has been created 
and that design thinking center is virtual as well as physical it's a blend but even though it is physical there are certain digital devices that are being used there now if they are covered with a mesh of cyber security what will happen the designer the innovator is absolutely feeling secure that my design my intellectual property will not leak now by the way there are fungible tokens also that are now coming out which means every innovation that we will do will have a digital imprint on it and that innovation will not be copied that means ip is also now going to move into tokens and those tokens will protect our ips if that is what is happening and if we have a cyber security mesh wherein people can use the prototype that we've done through design thinking but they don't get an access to anything that we don't want them to give an access to amazing stuff ip protected so what is a cyber security mesh a cyber security mesh is a defense strategy that means you can actually decide to what level you can build it now in my company since i deal with a lot of sensitive projects we have defense grade vaults and these are defense grade digital vaults which cannot be broken into because what happens in my company is we have so much sensitive data on leadership available with us because we conduct a lot of psychometric assessments of people those reports are available with me and i don't want anybody to either take those reports or maybe even indirectly capture any data from the report and therefore they are in a vault now the vault is also getting obsolete by the way the vault will move into drives the drives are going to be as a part of the cyber security mesh so i'm saving money there and i'm i'm changing my technology also so what is cyber security going to do you don't need to now have expensive vaults available you can actually stock up your entire digital content and it secures each device with perimeters which are not isolated singular perimeters but the entire design theme and the entire equipment that is being used for design thinking is completely protected through the cyber security mesh that means design thinking in defense projects will have a protection of the cyber security mesh and will design thinking enter the realm of defense security i guess it already has it's just that we're not talking about it decision intelligence now whenever we are running any design thinking project what is important for us is the hypothesis testing or the learning launch what if at each stage i were to get valid and reliable information if i start getting valid and reliable information i think my design thinking projects can be extremely speedy let's revisit the design thinking steps empathy mapping so i'm getting into empathize process now let's say i'm conducting interviews with a few hundred people and i want to collect data and if that data and the decision whether to use that data or not use the data is available in some decision intelligence system somewhere it's amazing all i need to do is i need to tell the system this is the particular problem area that i'm working on and all the data pertaining to that particular problem area i need to have and you have it available in a jiffy that's how it works let's say from the empathize process i then move into my root cause analysis and i want to define my problem statement i no longer need to go back to my stakeholders to check i may choose to but I have an intelligent system available to me which tells me whether the problem statement and the problem definition is accurately defined or not. I then move into an opportunity statement and I have an intelligent system which tells me whether the opportunity statement is truly an opportunity or is it a figment of my imagination. That's another thing that works. The next I would get into is prototyping. The decision system can tell me not only what are the various areas available in terms of the different apps in terms of the different data but the decision system can also run a test process and tell me whether that particular prototype solves the problem or does not solve the problem and when it comes to scaling the decision system also tells me steps and areas and locations where i need to scale up isn't that interesting i find it extremely fascinating 
and in fact businesses and organizations will have access to these intelligent systems which will ensure that the limited inventory of behaviors as well as data and experiences that organizations have will be transcended through the decision intelligence systems. Total experience. Now this becomes very relevant in design thinking. What is total experience? Total experience is, let's say, in the entire design thinking process, we create a museum. <coughs> Why do we create a museum? A museum is basically, like I said yesterday, we capture everything photographically and in terms of all the data that has been created and paste the chart papers, paste everything that we have created in the room. That's a museum. Why? Because we are trying to create an experience, a physical experience for people. Now we're talking about virtual design centers. Now let's say there's a virtual design center at play where because of the technology available, <coughs> a manager or a project leader or a sponsor can create a website of his own and call that as a design thinking virtual space where the design thinkers come and work together. And now you're providing a total experience. Now what happens in the total experience is the entire process of empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and then you test and scale. That entire experience is now available in a 3D experience on the cloud, recorded and kept, so that at every stage of the project, I can refer to any data that I want. And these systems of total experience will also have the power to transcript every conversation in every language which is understandable to people so we no longer have the culture and the language barriers though i agree that in translation some amount of just maybe lost but i don't know maybe even that will change with this kind of a total experience that design thinkers will go through they will be able to create some fascinating prototypes for sure and while they create these fascinating prototypes what would also happen is when you bring in your stakeholders and when these stakeholders who are going to ultimately give you a feedback on your design thinking product will move through this entire 3D experience themselves, you will actually get a lot more reliable and valid data on whether the design thinking problem that you worked up, worked on and the prototype that you've created is tangibly executable or not executable. This is the total experience that we're talking about. The total experience that we were dealing with in the physical world is now moving into the virtual reality. I think, I think teachers, how does this become relevant for teachers? I think if the total experience of the design thinking lab or if the total experience of your teaching were to be enabled through digital technologies for your students, I think, and I'm certain about that, universities and colleges which are now going borderless will be able to create a complete experience of a university in a 3d domain and the classrooms in a 3d domain where people all around the world can then enroll into a particular university of their choice and take up whatever curriculum they want but since we are talking about design thinking the total experience of the entire process of design thinking right from the first stage to the sixth stage can be emulated in this total experience. And this will give us a real-time, valid, intelligent, reliable data. Let me discuss three more, and then uh, I'll take the questions, and then we could go and take a break. Privacy enhancing computation. Now, this is going to be very relevant for design thinkers. That means each individual who is contributing to the design thinking realm will keep his or her privacy intact in a way that that particular individual wants it to be. I may disclose my identity. I may not disclose my identity. I may disclose certain amount of computation or certain amount of content that I'm doing. I may choose not to disclose. I will have the complete flexibility available in terms of how in a design thinking project at an individual level, 
what level of secrecy do I want to maintain? Now, let's say some of you here on the call today decide that you're going to specialize in certain area of your domain expertise and contribute to design thinking. You can decide as a digital nomad what is the level of security that you would want to preserve and for different clients and for different projects you can tweak that security so i think the question yesterday that we had in terms of the intellectual property and whether i will be able to control my intellectual stuff absolutely we're getting into that i think hyper automation is something i would like to touch upon for sure hyper automation is where we are now entering into the world when we enter into the industry 5.0 what is hyper automation organizations of the future will involve themselves in so much of automation and that too with rapidity that design thinking will have to ensure that it feeds to hyper automation which means every prototype that I launch, the risk of that prototype getting obsolete because of the shortened product life cycles is huge, absolutely huge. And therefore, in the space of hyper automation, where obsolescence levels, where disruptions are going to be the norm and organizations are going to automate top speed, design thinkers will have a fascinating career because what is design thinking going to do? Design thinking is not meant to create disruptions. Design thinking is meant to further bolster our innovations. What are we doing? We create a prototype, we do design thinking, we scale, we do design thinking, we scale it again, we scale it again. So the product life cycle curve that we have, after maturity, when the product moves into decline, because of design thinking, we are able to control that decline. And when we control that decline, we are also ensuring that in the world of hyper automation, not only do we capitalize in the world of hyper automation, but we also keep making our products absolutely relevant. How is the hyper automation happening? And how is design thinking enabling it? Robos are a reality. And intelligent robots are a reality. Now, if intelligent robots are a reality, you can feed in any amount of data into the robo and start creating any kind of product for sure. So what are design thinkers doing with robots? Maybe design thinkers will be a part of the extension of what a robot does. They are making robots more competent. Artificial intelligence is a part of hyper automation. What are design thinkers doing in artificial intelligence? Well, you don't know. Some of your electronic students or maybe your computer science students may be actually wanting to build a career in artificial intelligence and every artificial intelligence ultimately is a prototype. It is a product. It's a SaaS based service that is being provided. So if it's a software as service that's being done, obviously design thinking is a part and parcel of that. They're also capable of doing analytics because I said design thinking also moves big time into analytics. So hyper automation is absolutely in there. It is going to grow with massive magnitude. And I think that's where we need to tell our students that design thinking is going to help us tremendously and the demand for design thinkers will increase because of the hyper automation that's happening. Autonomic systems. These are inbuilt self-learning systems. Now imagine you are a design thinker and as a design thinker, your system is connected into this whole worldwide net through the artificial intelligence. The system itself is intelligent enough to learn and as it learns, it transmits the learning across all the borders. What is happening now? You are creating an inbuilt self-learning system that can dynamically optimize performance. And it will help you to deal with newer challenges. Why? Because now you're no longer dependent on the isolated learning of a human being. You are having a system that's learning on its own. These are going to be self-management softwares. And when we say these are going to be self-management softwares, what will they do? As you run the design thinking projects, they're going to learn what are you doing in the design thinking project. They're going to equip themselves furthermore. And to the extent 
that it will also have preventive mechanisms built into it because i have noticed a lot of times when complex data is being crunched the systems can go for a toss they can hang these are self-managed softwares that are correcting themselves and therefore the magnitude of design thinking projects that can be handled through the autonomic systems is huge i have talked about six technologies there's a lot more to come it's 11 22 right now i'm stopping the share so i'm stopping the share right now let me get on to certain questions and then possibly uh, we can then go for a break uh okay so we have this uh, some people saying audio not good some people saying audio absolutely good so i don't know you'll have to deal with it let's look at the first question that came up at 10 22 a.m sir all technologies or researches are not successful so is it possible to create sustainable business well, I agree that all technology and researches are not successful, but with the kind of technology that I've talked about and the kind of intelligence that is now coming into technologies and with the predictive analytics, which I will deal with uh, when we come back post lunch, we will be able to predict whether the technology has a life, whether it will do well, it will not do well, all that is going to be available. So my answer, and I don't want to really jump around giving this answer, technologies, also are entering the space of maturity they will be successful they will be robust but again the technology is created by a human being and if the technology is being created by a human being then obviously there could be some errors coming in but with the artificial intelligence coming in and with the blockchains coming in i think we are able to deal with that for sure <coughs> okay thank you satish for sending me the questions uh, so satish has already made a question there oh we've got a lot of questions to deal with for sure we have an excess of 15 questions. All right. All right. The Borderless book by Kenichi Omayo. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rima. Uh, that was great support. Listening is the best way of having imprint in our mind. So thank you. I mean, these statements also help us revise what you've learned, Dr. Anupa. Thank you so much uh, for putting this in. Multidisciplinary branches are the first step of integrating engineering, Dr. Anupama Patil. I completely agree with you. And design thinking is that particular moment of truth where the integration of engineering streams is going to happen for sure. I'm in the area of communication skills. Can design thinking be used for thinking effectiveness, which will lead to better communication? Can you give us some examples? Absolutely. I think, and I know as a coach, if our communication is not reaching people, that's not the right way to communicate. I think teaching is a practice where our communication decides whether the student is learning or not learning. Now, if I were to use design thinking steps where I talk to certain students, and I tell you what I do with corporates, and I do with students too, where I'm running design thinking in colleges as specialized curriculums. I ask the students, how would they want to learn? That's the empathize process. I ask the students, what is their preferred content that they would want me to emphasize upon? And that means every batch of mine, to a large extent, is customized. In corporate areas where I work, it's completely customized for sure. Then I would move into the process of ideation. I would sit down with the students and get into an ideation mode as to how this particular curriculum can be handled. Now, a lot of faculties have this beautiful practice of actually in their first session itself discussing the curriculum with the students. If you were to do the empathy map at that point in time, and if you were to do uh, the problem definition with them, where do you find difficulties in learning? And then you were to ideate with the students as to how the learning can be made more interesting. In fact, on uh, the website address that I'm going to give you, I have written a case paper on the 21st century learning methodologies. Maybe that case paper will help you in terms of how technology and academics are integrating themselves. <laughs> While that happens, you can prototype your learning and your communication methodology for that particular group. And there you go. That's the way it can go. Design thinking requires practice. I mean, it's easy. I understand it's easy for me to talk about the five stages here and let go. But yeah, I think once you start practicing, it works. Data security issues are also creating concern. Absolutely, Dr. Anhuma, but don't worry. Uh, the technologies that I'm talking about <clears throat> and the world is looking at IP and infringement of 
uh, intellectual space uh, done. <coughs> no problem. Is composable application akin to an off the shelf application, something like component object model? Well, it is not actually going to be off the shelf. But what can be done is if you like a particular application, you can just cut out that portion and make it available. But I can also agree with you to a large extent. Maybe that particular component may also be available as an off the shelf plugin, which is already available. So it's already happening. So there are two, two parts to the story here. Dr. Somya, the two parts of the story is I could plug out something from an app or I have that plug out already available uh, off the shelf, which I can purchase. Dear sir, kindly give us some idea for teaching video syllabus based on INAD for 100 marks. <coughs> also, your suggestion for teaching design thinking by PPT is acceptable idea. Oh, yeah, you could teach design thinking by PPT. No problem at all. Uh, you can pick up some small, small areas and you can simulate that in your classroom and you can teach design thinking. Not necessary. You have to take full blown projects. Uh, I leave it to your wisdom and the wisdom of the university as to how you would want to do it. And uh, obviously, I'm also giving you some content. Feel free to use it for sure. So for 100 marks, uh, you decide. I mean, the way I conduct my specialization courses in design thinking, it is ultimately a quiz, uh, which is a, a MCQ. Uh, currently, because COVID is not permitting in Pune, where I live, uh, to conduct uh, examinations. But once examinations are able to be conducted, I may have a clear question paper also built in where people will be given uh, situations and they would need to apply uh, design thinking and come up with their solutions. Uh, so it could be six or eight questions on prototyping for sure. Or maybe you have questions on each of the stages of uh, design thinking and you can build that up. So don't worry. I mean, uh, it's, it's completely creative. You can decide how you want to go about it. And I also do YWAS. Uh, around the project that students have done and uh, there are there is a panel of design thinkers available with me uh, which uh, gives a neutral rating to the people who come in for why was and that's how 100 marks tend to be covered uh, feedback link not a part of me sir is hyper automation is a threat to humans not at all not at all hyper automation is not a threat to humans at all the humans are the ones who will feed the hyper automation it's 1129 I'm stopping the questions here. I'll take rest of the questions when we come back at 1140 and then I'll take you into the specifics of the further technology. But while you do go for your break, here is the link to the center of excellence on atyasa.net. You will have a link in the menu where you have the design thinking center of excellence. You can go there and if you want to register yourself, feel free then you can become a part of our discussion forums also because we are creating a design thinking community. Thank you so much.